Yeah, I my relatives. Yeah, Mark Charles, you know, she Sin Bakeda Nanislin, the Tota Guni Bashes Chain. Sin Bakeda Nandasha Che, the Tota Chitni Dasha Nala. Hello, my relatives. It's Mark Charles. I'm once again talking to you from my home in Washington, D.C. And I want to acknowledge the Piscataway as the host people of the lands where I live, the lands uh, around Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland. Uh, I thank them for their stewardship of these lands, and I do not take for granted that I'm living on their lands. It's an honor to be here, and I want to make sure I honor the Piscataway as the host people of these lands. As I've said before, if you'd like to look up the people whose lands that you are living on around the country, the resource I usually start my, my research with is native-land.ca. And uh, it's a good resource. You can type in your city, your state, your zip code, and it will give you some of the history of that land, the treaties written there, the languages spoken there, and the nation or the tribe that was indigenous to those lands. So uh, that's a good resource for everyone to, to look at. Can he, people hear me okay? I just want to make sure the volume's set. Let me know if you're having a problem hearing me. But uh, last week, we began a discussion in our campaign uh, talking about our 100-day plan. And we laid out how in the first 100 days in office, I want to remove the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacy from the U.S. Constitution. And we focused a lot of our time and discussion around what that would mean, especially in race and especially regarding the abolishment of slavery and how we have to abolish slavery, which has never been abolished. The 13th Amendment merely redefines and codifies it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. And so we had a, a, some very good discussion, a lot of things online, as well as um, several things on our website. Uh, we posted up our 100-day plan. We posted up the edits we're proposing making to the Constitution. And we put up a, a one-pager on our blog. If you go to our, our markcharles2020.com and click on our blog, you can get access to our web page, or to our one-pager about the 100-day plan, as well as to um, the edits we're proposing to the Constitution. This week, I want to focus a little bit more on gender equity. And you heard me say before, I, I, a few years ago, I took some time to read through the Constitution. And when I did it, I was very prepared to see some of the racism and the white supremacy that's been embedded into the language of our Constitution. But as I began reading it, um, starting with uh, Article 1, Section 2, but going all throughout the Constitution, I was amazed how many times I ran across the gender-specific male pronouns. He, him, and his. Literally, 51 times. I, it, was, it was so frequently I started counting them as I was reading, because I was appalled at how, how frequently it was mentioned that he, him, or his, or sometimes it was male um, inhabitants, or you know, whatever else. And I was so shocked, I began counting them. And I came up with 51 gender-specific male pronouns. And so when I went through to edit it, I decided rather than having a gender-specific male pronoun, what if we used a gender-neutral pronoun? Instead of he, him, or his, use they, them, or there. Or maybe just the proper noun, the president, instead of him or his, um, the senator. You know, let's use proper nouns where possible and gender neutral pronouns when it's not possible to use a proper noun. And so those are the edits that we went into and added into the Constitution. And just like some of the facade of the Constitution had begun peeling away from me regarding race and white supremacy, once I saw how sexist the Constitution was, I began to, to just connect it more to the reality that we're living in. And so if you've watched our announcement video that we released a year ago, I talk about, you know, we have, we have women today earning 60 to 70 cents to the dollar. Um, that shouldn't surprise us. The Constitution is working. You know, I, I began to understand why we have the, the gender gap that we have in this nation um, because of the language we have in the, the Constitution. Now, I received several comments and, and words, feedback from people who said, well, that's the Old English, and the Old English actually, it, it, it means when you say him or his, it actually means it can apply to both male and female. And while that may be partially correct, can we not stop kidding ourselves? 
the 1700s were absolutely a very sexist space. Uh, okay, maybe maybe the old English can apply to both genders, but was there any sort of gender equity or gender equality? No. The sexism was so blatant back then. It was even assumed that women wouldn't vote. They were property. I mean, you know, going back further, it's just... So let's not pretend that just because the old English allows for maybe the inclusion of a female, that that was somehow recommended or good, or that they were inclusive back then. No, they weren't. They were incredibly sexist. And just like today, you know, if, if you, we, you cannot find a corporation today that's operating off of bylaws in the English written in the 1700s. Why? They'd be ripe for lawsuits. The language was incredibly sexist, incredibly exclusive, incredibly derogatory. So most corporations have updated their bylaws if they've been around for hundreds of years, and there are a few that have been. But as a nation, we still operate on bylaws written in the language of the 1700s. Now we've amended it, but you have to still read through this entire document that is very sexist, and you have to read all the, these he, him, and his, and males, and everything else, and, and then at the end, um, maybe there's a few things that say, well, we meant to say this, or this should now mean that. But even that is not fully there if you've heard about the Equal Rights Amendment. And I want to talk some about that, because something happened earlier this year that a lot of people weren't fully aware of, but Virginia, the state of Virginia in January of 2020, became the, the 38th state to ratify the ERA. So the ERA was first proposed, I think, back in the 1920s. It took almost 50 years until around the, the late 60s, early 70s, until it was even passed by Congress um, as an amendment. And then it went to be ratified, and they set kind of a, a, a sundown date of when it had to be ratified by. And they extended that date, and both those dates passed, and it wasn't ratified by enough states. And But again, just in January of of 2020, just a few months ago, Virginia became the 38th state to ratify it, giving it the, the number necessary for it actually to become an amendment. But since then, five states have actually revoked or rescinded the ratifications, Idaho, Kentucky, um, Nebraska, Tennessee, and South Dakota have rescinded their ratifications of the, of the ERA. And Virginia's ratification came a few decades after the amendment had essentially expired, or the, the date for the amendment to be ratified had expired. And so the ERA did not become an amendment of the United States. And there's some suggestion now, I think there's a lawsuit being filed about trying to get it to become an actual amendment. But again, what may end up happening is we may have to re- pass this amendment through the House and through the Senate and go through the ratification process again. This is insane. It's 2020, right? And we can't agree as a nation that we want women to be treated as equal constitutionally. We, we can't agree on that. That's embarrassing. It's appalling. So just like last week, we talked about how we still have slavery that's legal in our nation. Now we are not able to. We had an opportunity earlier this year to constitutionally treat women as equal, and we declined to do it. So this is why the sexism that is embedded into the Constitution needs to be dealt with. And this is why, in my proposed edits to the Constitution, I don't want to add an amendment at the end that says every time you read he, him, or his, you should actually use read inclusively as they, them, or their. No, because what the, that still requires you to read through this entire document in this racist or in this sexist language that sets your framework. And the way you hear and, and, and understand things. This is why I propose using the strike-through font. 
And instead of adding an amendment at the end saying, well, this now means something different, let's just change the text as we read it, right? It's our document. We wrote the Constitution. So we can edit it. It's not some holy scripture. No, it's a document written by some very racist, sexist, and white supremacist men. And we can very much edit it. And so this is what I'm proposing, is that we can actually remove this sexist language out of the Constitution so that it doesn't prefer males over anybody else. And it doesn't, you know, when you look about who is, who is the, the, the preferred being, the preferred person, the preferred group in our Constitution, You've heard me talk a lot about white landowning men, and that's very true. But if you, if you look even more specifically at the biases that we see today and of the history of our country, you would actually maybe want to go back and say white landowning heterosexual Christian men is the preferred group of our Constitution. And so, as our nation has been grappling even more in the past few decades, past decade, with um, not only gender equality, but gender identity and inclusion of the LGBTQIA plus 2S community. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the 2S, um, it's a term used within indigenous communities referring to two-spirited people. And it's kind of a blanket term that we use frequently within the Native community. And so, um, well, LGBTQ plus is probably the most common designation used. Um, LGBTQIA um, is a little more uh, precise. And then I have been encouraged, and I, I like to add the 2S on at the end, because it includes the worldview of Indigenous peoples and uh, includes that designation within that. And so even just last week, right, the Supreme Court ruled that... Um, gender identity, you know, the, the federal laws um, had to be inclusive of gender identity. And that was a, a major milestone for our country to pass that. And so again, while, while the LGBTQIA2S community has not been specifically named, the assumption has definitely been heterosexual men are kind of at the, at the, the, the preferred group within our constitution. And so by changing the language, this might actually negate the need for the ERA, right? Because if we can change the language that removes this preference, both implicit and explicit, for white heterosexual men, then our laws might be able to be enacted, written, and interpreted more fairly with a great, higher level of fairness than they are currently. Um, and so one of the proposals I have is that we remove this sexist language that, and most of the, the, the sexism in the Constitution is implicit because it refers only to males. It doesn't mention females. It doesn't mention the LGBTQIA2S community. And so it's an, more of an implicit bias, but the implicit bias is that it's, it's the white heterosexual male that's the preferred group. And so the challenge we face right now, and this is one of the challenges that I'm trying to um, get around, is because we have all of these groups that have been treated as other, right? We have African Americans specifically excluded or dehumanized in the Constitution. We have natives specifically excluded and dehumanized in the Constitution, referred to as savages in the Declaration of Independence. And we have women never being mentioned, or males only being mentioned um, throughout the entire Constitution. And so um, by changing that, changing that language, removing the racism, the sexism, and the white supremacy, then that puts the Constitution on much more of a of a an equal footing, and it may negate the need to pass amendments to now include all of these other different groups, right? So instead of an amendment that says natives are human too, and, and, and you know, black lives matter, and women are also included, 
um, by removing that exception or that preference from the Constitution, that can now imply that everybody is included. And I would argue if we need an amendment to actually correct it, rather than adding an amendment for every subset group in there, what if we just had a single amendment that said white landowning heterosexual Christian men are not superior? Right? If, if the bias is that they are, then rather than saying all these other groups are also human or equal, what if we just said, well, this group that wrote the document and assumed their own superiority, they're not superior, and they will be treated just as everybody else is. I, I, I think that would be much more of a blanket correction than adding a subset for every group that we learned is now being dehumanized or marginalized or left out of the document. Um, is let's take the preference away for the group that, that wrote the document and wrote the preference in for themselves in the first place. So these are some of the things that I, I, want, to, I want to do. And this is, again, part of my 100-day plan is to change this language. Now, just because we change the language, that doesn't mean it's going to be fixed right away doesn't mean suddenly everything is magically going to become equitable and equal and we're going to, we're going to be living in this, in this gray space. No, but I think if we have a document, if we have a constitution that does not prefer one group over another and uses inclusive language, then what that does is it changes the environment and it will help us understand what do we actually need more to be more equitable? What do we need more of? What do we need to address then? And so this is where I, I want to be careful not to get too far ahead of ourselves, because there's obviously some changes we need to make, right? We have a huge gender gap in pay, um, where, again, white men have a much higher rate of pay than almost every other group out there, especially um, gender-wise and race-wise. Um, we also have, uh, you know, the fact that women are financially punished for having children, which is one of the reasons why there's such a, a gender gap in pay. And so we, it's been said a lot that we're the only developed nation that doesn't have um, federally mandated paid family leave. Um, my only argument would be I, I would want to define what's a developed nation. <laughs> you know, if we're considering ourselves a developed nation, and yet slavery is still legal and women are not equal under our constitution, we might want to re-examine what we mean by what a developed nation is. Um, but yeah, we, we should probably be a nation. I would like for the United States to be a nation where we actually provide federally mandated paid family leave, where we provide the options for child care. So women who are ha have babies actually have options in their careers, in their professions, in their livelihoods, um, so that they're not solely constrained to a single role or to even a diminished role within our society. And we absolutely need to begin to address those issues and we need to pass laws to, to make sure that we have those, those sort of safeguards in place. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of ways, and there's a report that came out. There was, it was in 26, 2006, and then again in um, 2020. I want to just make sure I'm, I'm naming the report correctly. The World Economic Forum in 2020 came out with both a score and a ranking of nations as far as their gender gaps. And uh, there was a major study done in 2006. There was another major study done in 2020. And in 2006, our gender gap was rated um, at 7.04. So if one was there, was there was no difference between how gender the genders were treated, and zero was there was no like there was it was there was no parity. Um, we were point zero point seven zero four in 2006, which ranked us number 23 out of 153 countries. In 2020, our, our score increased. It went from um, 0.704 to 
0.724, but our ranking decreased, and we went from 23 down to 50. So what this means is that, and obviously we, we've made a few strides in, in closing the gender gap here in our country, and the world has done a better job of closing the gender gap. Um, we were, were done a little better this year than we did 14 years ago, but the world has improved at a greater pace than we have. And so even though our number, our, our score increased, um, our ranking decreased because more nations have been doing a better job of closing the gender gap. And again, the entire world needs to do a much better job at closing this gender gap. You know, the fact that even at, in 14 years ago, we were 20, we were 23rd and we had a 0.704 rating, um, that's, again, not healthy, that's not good. So we there's a lot of work we need to do, and we need to begin to close this gap even more. Um, and this is one of the things that I am, I want to work on as, once we are able to remove the sexism from our Constitution, I want us to, to be able to work on what else do we need to do, because it's not going to magically change overnight, but what else do we need to do to create better gender equity? Um, and uh, even among sexual identity, how can we do that better than we've done in the past, and even how can we do better for the entire globe um, in this area? And so we need to look at things like uh, paid family leave, we need to look at things that like child care options, we need to look at things of, of decreasing the, the pay gap, um, there are a lot of things we need to be looking at within our country. We need to be looking at women's re reproductive health and how can we make sure that women have access to reproductive health um, in their lives. And so all of these things we need to address. But rather than addressing that first, I would say we need to remove the sexism from the Constitution first. And then we can see where we're at and make the decisions of what do we need to do to, to get us the rest of the way to our goal. But if we don't first remove the sexism from our constitution, we're never going to get there because the basis is going to start, the, the basis of our law is going to be flawed from the beginning. And so this is where I want to fix that first and then reevaluate to see where we're at to what do we need to do to get where we want to go um, and how can we be moving there, uh, moving that forward. So. I want to be talking more about this this week. I encourage you to send questions to our website, markcharles2020.com. You can go to the Q&A section and you can submit questions about these issues. Um, I really want to have a dialogue about this this week and what do we need as a nation to do um, and how can we best move this issue forward in our country. Uh, as a candidate, I am very interested in making sure that, that we are able to close this gap and we are able to have a nation where, again, as I've said many times, we the people actually means all the people. The rest of the week, we also are going to be working on a lot of issues regarding um, ballot access. And so uh, we have a huge deadline this week, Thursday, with uh, the New Mexico signatures being required. And I will be honest, things are not looking good. Um, it does not look like we're going to make enough ball enough signatures to, to get onto the ballot um, by um, this Thursday. If you have sent in your signatures to us this week, unfortunately, we cannot do this electronically. The only way we can do this is uh, to have you send to mail the signature to our campaign, and then we can turn it into the, the state of New Mexico. And so if you, you might be able to still get it to us in time if you mail it today. Um, but if you have not mailed it by now, we may not be able to get your signature. And we're reevaluating what are we going to do as a campaign if we miss this deadline. We needed 3,483 signatures. I don't think we're going to make it. And so we are going to reevaluate of what are our, are our options, um, at least what can we try to do um, if we've missed this deadline. Uh, is there anything else we can do to, to try and get on the ballot in the state of New Mexico? So if you have a signature you haven't sent in yet, please send it in. Um, if you if you have sent it in, thank you. We are very appreciative for everyone who signed our petition to get me on the ballot there. And we will be letting you know in the next few days and weeks of what we're going to be doing in New Mexico if we don't make it on the ballot there by this Thursday. 
There are a few other states we're actively collecting signatures in, uh, the state of Illinois. We are most excited about right now because we just started collecting signatures there last week, and we can collect those signatures remotely. It takes just a few minutes. Just go to our website, markcharles2020.com, click on ballot access, click on the state of Illinois, and the petition is right there. You can sign it. You can sign your signature with your finger on your smartphone. You can sign it with a stylus or with your mouse on the computer. And uh, we can collect your signature today if you're a registered voter in the state of Illinois. And we only need 2,500 signatures in Illinois. Uh, the previous number was 25,000. And because of the coronavirus and the pandemic, they've reduced that down to 10%. So we only need 2,500 signatures and we have a month left to collect them. So if you live in the state of Illinois, if you have family or friends there, please let them know about our campaign, about what we're trying to do, and we would love to get on the ballot as soon as possible in the state of Illinois. We're also collecting signatures in Alaska, in uh, North Dakota, and in New Hampshire. Um, and so if you live in those states, again, go to ballot access on our website, click on those states, you can download those petitions, you can print them, you can sign them, and you can send them to us. There's information on those, on those pages on our website. There's a few states we may begin collecting signatures in soon. Um, I think Utah, we're going to start collecting signatures there fairly soon. There's a lot of states we haven't heard anything back yet of what they've done to change their criteria or what the new process is. So we have um, a staff member who is now dedicated solely to ballot access and reaching out to the states. And so check back to our website frequently on our ballot access page and find out the most up-to-date information we have on how to get on the ballot within your state. Uh, we're also raising money to get on the ballot in the state of Oklahoma. Now, we are in the midst of our best fundraising month yet. We've raised um, over $12,000 this month, which for our independent campaign is fantastic. We need $35,000 uh, by the uh, 25th of July to get on the ballot in the state of Oklahoma. And so we are raising money to get on the ballot there and if you can help us, that money can't doesn't only need to be raised in Oklahoma. It can come from anywhere throughout the United States. And so no matter what state you live in, um, if you are able to, we invite you to donate to our campaign. You're helping us increase our staffing. You're helping us improve our messaging. You're helping us do more outreach. And you're helping us get on the ballot in the state of Oklahoma. So if you can uh, donate to our campaign, go to markcharles2020.com. Click on the Donate bun button, and we would love to have your your support and your donation to this campaign so that we can help move it forward in every way possible. Um, that's all I have for now. So this is some exciting stuff we're working on right now. Our discussion this week that we're going to be talking about in our messaging is on removing um, the sexism from the Constitution and of creating gender equity and um, also uh, regarding uh, gender identity. And so I welcome you to submit questions. I look forward to having more dialogue about this. We are going to get our TikTok account going this week. We got signed up for it last week. We're hoping to make our first, our first post on there later this week. I've actually been tagged by several people on TikTok. So if you're on TikTok and you're waiting for us to get there, we should be on there soon. We're also very active on our social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and of course on our YouTube channel. So uh, engage with us online. Our growth has been uh, very exciting online. It's our, all of our accounts both our Mark Charles 2020 accounts as well as my personal account, which is Wireless Hogan, have a lot of activity in the past few weeks. And so continue that. We are not yet getting a lot of mainstream media coverage, but we are getting a lot of attention online. And so continue to share, continue to dialogue, continue to introduce us to your friends and families and coworkers. And this campaign is definitely moving forward in some very exciting ways. Um, I think that's all I have for right now. Let me see if there's any questions or anything I need to address uh, specifically from the comments here. But it looks like, yeah, I appreciate everybody commenting and helping us move forward, uh, hashtagging. Do whatever you can. And one of the things we're recommending to people, because a lot of our campaign is about continuing to just raise awareness. And while I've said that a lot of mainstream national media um, does not want to cover us, I think a lot of local media is more open to covering our campaign. 
So if you have a local newspaper, a local radio station, a local podcast, a local TV station that you think might want to do a story on our campaign, by all means, put them in touch with us. We would love to engage with local media about our campaign, about what we're doing, about ballot access, about our 100-day plan, um, all the things that we're actively working on. So, and you can help out with that. Um, you know, if you have a connection to your local newspaper, to your local TV station, your local radio stations, give them a call and let them know about our campaign and um, get on our virtual street team and get some of the, the images and the graphics we're putting out. Um, connect them to our YouTube channel and the videos that we're producing. We would love to set up interviews or to, to give profiles to people so that we can really get the word out about our campaign even at the local level. So yeah, my relatives, thank you very much. I hope you have a great day, and I look forward to engaging with you throughout the rest of the week. But go net, walk in beauty, and maybe learn how to walk in beauty together.